Hello, and welcome to the MIT SDM Systems Thinking webinar series. My name is Naomi Gutierrez, Communications Administrator for SDM, and I am today's host. Thank you for joining us. Today's speaker is Dr. Tyson Browning, Professor of Operations Management in the Neely School of Business at Texas Christian University. In this role, he has conducted research on managing complex projects, including integrating managerial and engineering perspectives, and taught MBA courses on project management, operations management, risk management, and process improvement. He is currently co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Operations Management. In addition to his academic research and presentations, Dr. Browning has trained and advised organizations such as BNSF Railway, General Motors, Lockheed Martin, and the U.S. Navy. He holds two master's degrees and a PhD from MIT, and we're pleased to welcome him back virtually to MIT today. His talk today is titled Planning, Tracking, and Reducing a Complex Project's Value at Risk. If you have questions for Tyson, please enter them into the chat window at the side of the video. They will be addressed during the Q&A portion of this session, and a recording of this presentation will be available online after today's session. A link will be sent to all registrants. And with that, Tyson, please go ahead. Thank you, Naomi. It's a pleasure to be here with you to come back to MIT virtually and present on a topic that goes back to my time as a graduate student at MIT. As you can see from the list of sources at the bottom of this title slide, uh, this goes all the way back to my dissertation as a topic that's been on my mind and thinking and part of my research for about 25 years. It began when I was a researcher with the Lean Aircraft Initiative, as it was called at the time, at MIT. And we were working with companies such as Boeing and Lockheed Martin and others. And one aspect of that project dealt with product development and questions of what is lean? How does lean apply in that context? And really sparked a lot of the questions that led to this topic and this study. Some of these motivating questions are as follows and certainly apply very broadly, not just to aerospace, not just to product development, but to all kinds of projects. And they include how to measure progress in complex projects. What does it mean to make progress? How do we know if we're making progress? How do we know if that progress is enough? How do we know if we're ahead or behind schedule or plan, or is that even right? How do we plan and track not just cost and schedule, but things such as technical performance, quality, scope? And then for that and for cost and schedule, how do we account for uncertainty? How do we account for risk, opportunity? How do we trade off among these areas? Technical performance versus project cost or budget and duration or schedule? And how do the uncertainties and risks and opportunities figure into all of this? So these types of questions are important. And as we go through them, I'd encourage you to think about the projects you've been involved with, your experience. How would you answer these questions for those projects? And what challenges did you run into accordingly? Regarding product development projects in particular, I'd like to highlight a few observations. First, these projects are typically aiming for some kind of result that is trying to achieve chosen goals, whether we call these objectives or targets or requirements, maybe different words for different contexts. I'll use the word goals generically here as what the project's aiming for, often assuming that by achieving those goals, the project's going to add value or be successful, which is not always true, but we can, kind of take as a given that achieving these goals would probably be a positive thing for most projects. Product development is a creative discovery process. It's iterative, not linear. It's not so easy to lay out the activities, the tasks between where we begin such a project and that final destination we're aiming for. Often we'll learn a lot as we go. And the task to be done, Simply checking the boxes is not sufficient to guarantee that we reach that chosen destination and those selected goals. Therefore, in product development projects, but I think more broadly in a much 
larger variety of complex projects, uncertainties are costly, and some more so than others. And as we gain knowledge, as we learn about what will and will not work on the project and the path towards that destination, then that knowledge replaces our uncertainty, hopefully reduces our uncertainty. And this is valuable. This is useful. One of the most common ways to track progress in projects is called earn value management. And I figure some of you may be familiar with it, others maybe not, but this is a method that's come into the mainstream. It's part of the Project Management Institute's body of knowledge in their guidebook, for example. And it's been around for decades and attempts to track things like actual cost and earn value against a planned value. But it has some problems some shortcomings. It's better than not tracking these things at all, but it can be misleading. First, it takes a completely deterministic view of cost and schedule. It doesn't account for uncertainty or risk. It assumes we know exactly how long activities should take, for example, how much they should cost. It ignores completely the third dimension of what's sometimes called the iron triangle in projects. There is nothing there about quality or performance or scope of the project, except in what's implicit in terms of the activities that have been specified. EVM tracks what's really called perceived progress in terms of a famous paper by Cooper in the Project Management Journal about rework, meaning that there's a difference between actual progress and perceived progress due to undiscovered rework and other things we don't know we don't know yet about what's lacking in our results as we go through a project. So despite the occurrence of this word actual throughout the earn value management methodology, it's actually perceived rather than actual progress that's getting tracked. And therefore, EVM can sometimes create some perverse incentives. For example, we get credit, we earn value in EVM by doing activities. So we're often choosing to do easy activities first because it gives us credit. Or we may like to start some easy activities to try to get back on track if it looks like we're behind. This can cause us to start some activities prematurely, which in projects, is very problematic. Often there's nothing physically preventing us from beginning certain tasks because the inputs, the precedent, precedents, relationships, or dependencies for those activities are often purely information. And in those cases, we can simply make assumptions about that information and go ahead and begin the activity. But this increases the risk of these activities going forward that they will have to do rework later. So not only does EVM ignore rework, it actually potentially could make it more likely. We all also should question when we see the word value in EVM, what does it really mean? What type of value is really being managed? There's nothing here about stakeholder value or the value of information or value at risk. Some concepts that we'll be thinking about a little more as we go forward here. Ultimately, progress depends in projects, not on the boxes we check, but on what we actually accomplish. It's not how we spin our wheels, but it's the traction we get to move forward that matters. Somehow we need to differentiate our progress in projects from merely being able to say we've done certain things. Rather, what have those things now allowed us to know? and what value do they therefore add? I'm gonna introduce several concepts and in some cases add some quantification to them to give you kind of the tip of the iceberg of a framework called the Project Value, Risk and Opportunity Framework. The first concept I wanna introduce is project value. And there's a couple aspects to this. First, let's realize that project value depends on what the project actually delivers at the end. Therefore, until that point, uh, for sure, we don't know exactly what that actual value is going to be. The value for, of a project depends on the stakeholder's preferences for a combination of some attributes of the project and its results. 
if this is a product development project, then what are the attributes of that developed product? That's going to go a long way to determining how satisfied the stakeholders would be with the project's result. Stakeholders generally want more of some attributes or aspects from the project and its result. In product development or service development, these could be some examples like features, functions. How reliable is it? How large or small is it? How fast or slow is it? Is it available when we want it? What's the design aesthetic and so on? Some of these attributes are fairly straightforward to quantify, others less so. And of course, stakeholders may want fewer or less of some other attributes. They always would prefer to pay less, both upfront and in an ongoing sense. They may want it to be lighter. They may want to have it faster and so on. So thinking about products that you've purchased, there's typically just a handful of key attributes that really, in the end, make that purchase decision. What are the order winners in those cases? That's a similar idea to this one for a project. What are the things the stakeholders ultimately are gonna really focus on as they decide, was this project successful or not? And so we can think of the overall project value as a composite of its salient attributes. And I've found that in most cases, even large complex projects, there are fewer than 10 of these that are extremely important to focus on. And that's good because that's a manageable number. And I'm gonna call these project value attributes or PVAs for short. In this framework, we'll attach a value function to each PVA. This is where we quantify things a bit. This is essentially a kind of utility function, although the units we might choose to use on the y-axis are not necessarily utility in a zero to one scale. But in this case, in this example, we're using revenue, essentially a market size that a product, in this case, a drone aircraft, would be trying to capture some portion of. And here, the value function is for the project value attribute endurance. How long can this drone aircraft fly continuously before it would have to land? Clearly, this is a larger is better attribute. More is better. So you see that as the endurance increases from left to right on the x-axis, the amount of revenue expected from being able to sell a product with this attribute increases. And market research, focus groups, discussing with customers, this is what marketing functions are doing all the time. There are a lot of uh, important pitfalls to avoid and guidelines to follow in assembling these type of value functions. This one happens to be shown here as piecewise linear. Of course, they could be in a number of shapes or forms. But the idea is for each of the five to 10 PVAs on the project to develop one of these value functions. They might be larger is better, like this one, increasing from left to right. For our drone aircraft example, here are five other PVAs. And the first three of these other ones are also larger is better. Notice a few different shapes here. We have one for unit price where some nominal amount is best and more or less is less desirable. And then on the bottom, we have one where smaller is better. Uh, here it's delivery lead time. As that increases, the market's interest in buying this product also decreases. I also want to think about project value in terms of four different types. There's the type of project value that we would hopefully know at the project's completion point. Now, technically, this is not true that we know it fully and completely even at that point. But for simplicity, I'm going to say that that's the part of project value we'll know the most about when the project is completed, what's its actual value. Meanwhile, prior to project completion, especially early on in the project, there are other ways of looking at value that we should think about. First, what's the desired value? What do stakeholders really want? Sometimes they can articulate this, sometimes not. 
sometimes it may be tacit. So the desired value from stakeholders for the project and its result. We want to distinguish that from what I'll call the goal value, meaning certain goals and requirements and targets, objectives have been chosen for our project. What's the value of merely meeting those? These may or may not be the same as the desired value because we may have deliberately or inadvertently chosen goals for the project that differ from the stakeholder's ideal result. And often it's hard to get the ideal result for all stakeholders. Often we're content to satisfy or somehow accomplish something that's valuable, but of course stakeholders could always want more. So there's another argument why the project's goal value might be different than, usually less than, maybe an ideal desired value from stakeholders. And then a fourth way of looking at value in an incomplete project is something I'll call the likely value. Given the project's capabilities, I'll talk more about this in a moment, what is its estimated value at completion? What is its forecast uh, outcome for each of these project value attributes that we're interested in. Again, that may or may not be forecast to meet the goals, depending on how challenging those goals are. Let's talk more about this goal value of a project for a moment. And we'll go back to the value function for the endurance PVA. For each project value attribute, say the project sets a goal. And for endurance, let's say it's 22 hours. Well, once that goal has been chosen or selected there, it implies some amount of value. And if we're measuring value in terms of revenue that we would expect from selling these units after they're developed and produced, then here we could find what the value of meeting that goal would be in terms of revenue. And these types of business cases and projections are done all the time. Of course, they're fraught with many difficulties, but they're often the best we can do. And really this framework, what we're trying to do is pull from marketing, the best knowledge we have about these aspects and try to integrate it into a framework that systems engineers and program and project managers can all work together and uh, make trade-offs as needed based upon. The overall goal value for the project, of course, will depend on, a com on the combination of PVAs, not on just one of them. We also want to think about how the project goals are partly responsible for determining the risks faced by the project. Here, those three types of value that we are tracking or thinking about prior to project completion and us knowing its actual value First, we want to think about if there's some risk we won't meet our goals in our project, if its likely value is somehow less than its goal value, this is typically what we think about in terms of project risk, risk of not meeting the chosen goals or objectives. We can also think about any difference between the goals and objectives we've chosen and what the stakeholders or the market more generally might desire. And think about this as market risk. The reason for distinguishing these two is because it begs a question that some projects face about how high to set the bar. What goals and objectives should we choose? And it's interesting to observe in many cases here that if we make the goals easy to achieve, if we lower the bar, then that reduces the project's risk. However, it typically increases the market risk as we lower that goal value towards the likely value, the project risk will go down, but the market risk will tend to increase. Similarly, if we raise the bar, make the goals more challenging, then we can maybe cut into that market risk, but we might make our project more challenging and make its risk higher. I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes, but for now, let me introduce a second concept called project capabilities. The idea here with project capabilities is essentially how likely is the project to be able to do what we want it to do. This depends on the resources available to it, like technologies, expertise, skills, 
people, processes, and tools, all the things that go into what we often refer to as capabilities. What are the potential paths we might take to reaching the project's goals? What obstacles or challenges might lie along that, those paths? What partners, suppliers do we have and what are their capabilities? And how well are we able to manage all of this? All of these figure into what I'll call project capabilities. And the idea here is that for each of the project value attributes, each of these key characteristics that are salient to determining most of the project's overall value, let's make a forecast of how good are we? How likely are we to be able to get certain outcomes for each of these project value attributes, PVAs? We're gonna call these forecasts project capability distributions. The idea with these distributions or probability distributions as our capabilities improve, these distributions will shift in a favorable direction. If larger is better, then they'll shift towards the right. And if smaller is better, they'd shift towards the left. If we're talking about movement on the x-axis, for example. Also, they capture uncertainty in the capability to achieve the project value attribute outcome. So if we've got less uncertainty about our outcomes, we'll have a fairly narrow distribution. If we have more uncertainty, we'll have a wider distribution. Going back to our drone aircraft example, here's a project capability distribution for the endurance PVA based on answers to three basic questions. What is the best case? What's the worst case? And what's the most likely potential outcome? So we're asking our subject matter experts more from the engineering and technical side, the designers, rather than the project value attribute functions where we were talking maybe more to the marketing people earlier. Now we're bringing in the perspective of the project's subject matter experts. And we can do this in a fairly more sophisticated way like a Delphi process. We can use a frequency distribution of votes we get from even like an internal market to build this type of distribution. But here I'm just taking a very simple triangle distribution based on answers to those three questions and inferring what is the relative likelihood of endurance outcomes in this case between the best and worst case outcomes. And given that there's a most likely outcome somewhere along the way there. Similarly, do this for each of the other project value attributes. Here in this drone aircraft example, there are six. And we see you know, simple triangle distributions for each of these. The idea though, is that as we move through a project, as we gain more information, hopefully we'll be able to narrow these distributions as we learn more about the potential outcomes. This slide flips the distribution on its side. So now the PVA is on the y-axis instead of the x-axis, like on the previous slide. And here time is on the x-axis. As we move left to right through project time, we've got essentially a third dimension of probability coming out of the slide here, where these triangle distributions over time are getting narrower. Now there's no guarantee that they will shift in a favorable direction, which here is upwards as they're shown in this example. So we can see at the left side, the probability of meeting our goal, which is the dashed horizontal line, is fairly low, but towards project state N plus two later in the project, it's fairly high. Well, this is very nice when it happens, but it's not guaranteed, of course. But we could think about what causes this distribution to change shape and to move up or down as we go through the project. First though, let's think about is merely tracking the probability of reaching a goal sufficient? Here in this diagram, I'm showing two uh, distributions, PCDs at different points in project time. The lower, uh, flatter, wider distribution is initially in the project. It's very wide. There's a lot of uncertainty about what the eventual outcome will be in terms of the drone aircraft's range. However, later in the project, we have a much tighter distribution. 
where, with much less uncertainty in the outcome. What's the probability of failing to meet the goal? It turns out it's essentially the same in both of these cases. So it should be obvious for this reason that probability of meeting the goal is not sufficient enough to tell us what's going on here. What's really changed? Well, later in the project, we're in a much better situation because even though there's some probability of an outcome less than 2100, there's no probability of an outcome less than about 2,075, which is meaning if we miss the goal, it's not going to be by much. Whereas early in the project, there were possibilities of outcomes as low as 1950 or 2000 that would have a much larger negative impact on the project's value. So monitoring uncertainty is not enough. We also need to think about the impact of these outcomes. And this is where we start heading towards the idea of risk. So to think about the impact of an outcome, it could be positive or negative, a bonus or a penalty. With the endurance attribute we started with earlier, if we chose a goal at 22 hours, for example, it would imply a certain amount of value here, about $1.3 billion in potential revenue for our, our project. Whereas if we miss that goal, let's say we come up with eventually a drone aircraft's endurance only at 20 hours, then there's some penalty here, 334 million that we could read off of our value function if we look at 20 hours and its result over on the y-axis. So for any outcome that fails to achieve our goal, we experience some kind of penalty in its value. On the flip side, if we exceeded our goal, for example, 24 hours, then we're going to get a bonus in our value here. Any outcome that exceeds the goal could have a positive impact. Risk will be quantified here in terms of uncertainty and its adverse impacts. So we're going to sum over that region of outcomes that fail to achieve our goal and look at their relative probability and their value penalty. So the adverse outcomes, the probabilities come from the PCDs, the value penalties impacts are coming from those PVA value functions. And then we do this for each PVA and we have to build a composite to look at overall project risk. This risk index, as we'll call it, captures information about both uncertainty and its impact in a single scalar variable, which is a useful construct that we can talk about as maybe the cost of our uncertainty or the expected value loss due to this performance outcome, the portion of the project's value being put at risk by the prevailing uncertainty and its impact. These are different conceptual ways we might uh, have, a, have an intuition about the meaning of this term risk. Let's, I think, put this in a useful context uh, using maybe an Olympic high jumper or pole vaulter as an example. If we put our project's outcomes on a vertical here, better outcomes at the top, worse outcomes at the bottom, and we set our goal here at the bar at some point, then we have a distribution of potential project outcomes where we'll actually end up with our project. And the examples I showed before were triangle distributions. Here it's a normal distribution. We can use any distribution that makes sense for a project value attribute or for the overall project. The idea though is that some of the project's goal value or the project's goal value is determined by the height of that bar in the context of high jumping or pole vaulting, you don't really get additional value by clearing the bar by a large amount. But in our context here, you might get a value uh, bonus by getting over the bar at some higher level. However, the possibility of not getting over the bar, the adverse outcomes, are what put some of the project's goal value at risk. And similarly, 
if we've got a good outcome, a good possibility of a value bonus, then we could get over that bar and achieve some additional value at opportunity. This means that we can think about designing a project for value, tailoring it for risk at the very beginning based on the goals we choose and the capabilities we have. Essentially, we're thinking about the likely value of our project depending on where we set the bar, how high is it, and what are our capabilities? How good are we as a jumper in terms of each of these project value attributes we face? These goals and uncertain capabilities are going to, going to render a portion of our project's goal value at risk, and they may also point to some additional value at opportunity, sort of on the table, uh, if we increased our goals. There's a quantitative framework for all of this in one of the papers mentioned on the title slide. I'm not able to go in that in great detail, but I would like to give you a high level overview of this PBRO framework. It's essentially the concepts that we've introduced already. We've got a set of project value attributes, each with a value function and each with a capability distribution. We select project goals for these. We use the goals and the value functions to determine what are the goal values for each of the project value attributes. And we also use them to determine what portion of that value is at risk and at opportunity. We need a composite model, and I don't have time to go into those right now, but the papers do, that allow us to combine these PVA values and look at the overall project goal value. Similarly, an overall project portion of value at risk and at opportunity. We then can use these to help plan the project, to think about all of the dimensions, all of the PVAs, and how much risk and opportunity there might be in each, realizing that part of that's due to where we set the bar, what goals have we chosen. We may want to increase or decrease, renegotiate some of the goals and requirements. Also, it could depend on our capabilities as a jumper. Maybe we need to pump more resources, skills, technologies into certain areas. All of this helps give us a big picture view that helps us try to uh, take on appropriate amounts of risk, not inappropriate amounts, and think about how we're trading off and balancing among the important aspects that drive the project's ultimate value. In addition to planning projects with this, we can also track, monitor, control projects in an ongoing sense. When we think about these capability distributions, generally decreasing in size as we learn more, gain more information, this is useful for tracking progress. And we can think about that in terms of individual project value attributes. We can also think of it in terms of a composite for the overall project. Are we decreasing the portion of the project's value being put at risk by the likelihood of the outcomes in these project value attributes. Rather than going more into the quantitative aspects, I want to focus more on the conceptual aspects in the few minutes we've got left. As we move through the project, let's return to these questions about how do we know if we're making progress? What does that look like? What does that really mean? Well, as a project unfolds, we're gaining useful information and we're moving towards that point at the end of the project where we'll know its actual value. Remember at the beginning of the project, we don't know that yet. We can only try to forecast it. So we're doing things in our project. We're accomplishing activities that produce useful information. And it's this useful information that's really adding the value. Well, how's that happening? It's replacing, it's eliminating uncertainty. It's converting potential value to actual value. It's decreasing the portion of the project's value being put at risk by that uncertainty. So how do we add value? Not by just doing things, but rather by the information, by the results produced from the accomplishments of activities. Or we can view this differently. We can focus on the green, trying to add value. We could also focus on the red here, 
and think about progress in terms of removing the threats to value, what I'll call anti-value. Let's connect this conceptually to some other project examples. Uh, here is some interesting data from an old Harvard Business School teaching case that looks at the difference between estimated and actual project duration as the project moves forward. At the beginning of the project in 1984, they estimated how long would it be until this project was completed. That estimate was wrong. How much was it wrong? By almost 1,800 days, years, in other words. However, as they progressed through the project over time, the difference between the estimate of the project's outcome in terms of its duration and the actual outcome continued to decrease. So even though they were not ever really able to perfectly predict that outcome until a few months before the project completed, their ability to hone in and get closer with those predictions is clear. And that's the idea of trying to replicate here, that as we move through time, we can't necessarily know what the most likely outcome is going to be, cer certainly not yet what the actual outcome is going to be for each PVA, but we are often able to eliminate some of the extreme cases. As we learn more about what will and will not work, we are able to hone in on what the likely outcomes for our particular PVAs will be on a project. So as the projects evolve, their outcome estimates evolve. And this is largely due to the information produced by the activities that are done on the project. This is even really interesting to me in a broader sense, because I don't know if any of you are sports fans who noticed on the ESPN app and perhaps elsewhere, these charts emerging over the course of a game, I've seen these for football, for basketball, for other sports, where there's a probability of winning for, for either team. And this probability changes throughout the game. Each play run in an American football game is changing this probability. And it's very interesting, very early in a game, a simple running play that doesn't gain any yards, doesn't nudge this too much. But in the last minute of a football game, a simple running play that gains no yards but uses up time could make all the difference in the world here. And so the idea is that each play in the game is more or less affecting the probability of its outcome. And that's changing over the course of the game. It's not just the play, but when it happens, that also matters. And that's the same idea we want to think about in terms of progress and projects. Each activity we do, each outcome we get, the information we produce, revises our ability to estimate where we're going to end up with each project value attribute. So we want to focus not on the whole ocean of information out there, but on the information that really revises the things that matter, the things that determine value for our project and its result. And we're capturing that with these project capability distributions. As they evolve over project time, risk, opportunity, value also evolve. And we can think about reducing uncertainty, which is not itself enough. We have to think about, are we actually reducing the risk? So as we think about, is our project making progress? What's really happening over the course of the project? The uncertainty tends to go down. The project capability distributions are getting narrower. Design trade-offs may shift these PCDs as we change priority, as we reallocate resources. We can shift these up or down. We may change their shape as well. As the PCDs evolve, the likely value, the risk, and the opportunity that we're tracking for our project will change. And of course, any adjustments we make to the project's goals, if those get renegotiated or reset, those could also affect this. The PVRO framework that you can read about more in the papers I mentioned earlier, quantifies and monitors all this for individual PVAs and then as composites for overall projects. 
key ideas here, we want to think about reducing a project's portion of value being put at risk. It's the value adding work that we're doing in the project that's producing useful information that reduces the portion of the project's value being put at risk by these threatening uncertainties. We're trying to increase our competence in being able to get over the bar that we're not likely to get adverse outcomes that are providing huge threats to our value and our goals here. This leads to a different way of defining a project or conceptualizing a project as the work we're doing to eliminate the risk of not achieving its goals. This is a kind of double negative in its construct. And I realize that. But what it's really saying is that we're trying to look at a project and its progress and its adding of value, maybe less a, as a painter with a blank canvas at the beginning to which we're putting stuff on it, maybe more as a sculptor, where we start with a block and we're taking things away to get what we want or to prove, to demonstrate, to verify and validate that we're actually going to provide something of value. Implications here, as we wanna manage a project for value, we wanna think about tracking not only the best current estimate of the project's situation or value, but also think about the uncertainty bounds around that estimate. There's a lot of additional benefit by accounting for those and their implications for risk and opportunity. Like I said earlier, earned value does not do that. It assumes a point solution, a point estimate. And here we wanna think about that point estimate could bounce around like a stock market ticker as the project moves. There's no real way to know or predict exactly where it will end up, but we do have the ability to essentially assume that the distribution around that point will get narrower and narrower as we learn more and more. And we can actually choose activities that will produce information that deliberately caused that point of the narrowing of the distribution to occur sooner rather than later. Real progress then produces useful information that reduces the portion of the project's value at risk, that essentially burns that down. We're chipping away the anti-value, the threats to the value to reveal the clearer image of our project's actual value. And if we don't like the way that looks, then we're going to have to control the project by recasting something, changing the goals, maybe raising, lowering the bars in some of these PBAs or reallocating resources, whether that's adding resources to the project overall or just shifting them to emphasize a different PBA. As managers, we can plan, we can identify appropriate things to be doing in the project and when we do them in the project. We'd love to fail fast. We'd love to tackle the big risks first in our project to demonstrate viability, rather than allow a project to begin doing a lot of simple, easy things just because it can claim credit or quote, earn value for them. Uh, we wanna focus on the things that really matter earlier in the project to create appropriate information, reduce appropriate risks, to force us to identify areas of ambiguity, break those down, not starting all of our project stoplights at green and then being surprised later when they turn yellow or red, but rather kind of start red and assume that we don't know yet where we're gonna end up until we can prove that we're yellow and then green. We wanna focus on key performance attributes and driving early estimates of those is useful. So as managers, whatever we can do to try to think about what's the relative likelihood of ending up with certain outcomes and what are the implications of that, that's useful. This helps us emphasize the importance of uncertainty and risk reduction, not just in product development, but in projects in general. It encourages designers and those working on projects to communicate in terms of spread 
in terms of confidence, in terms of uncertainty, not just assuming that if I give you a number, that's guaranteed to be exactly what it will be at the end of the project. So decrease emphasis, focus on point solutions. And this fits very well for those of you familiar with concepts like set-based design, that we want to think in terms of ranges of possibilities and narrowing those over project time as we can hopefully converge on solutions rather than just going in and telling everyone it's going to be X, but everyone knows by tomorrow or next week, it will no longer be X. This helps us link activities to results that they provide. I think activities are a nice uh, construct, a nice building block, really the nexus of methodologies here because they're already essential in project time and cost models. However, we need to think about that third performance quality technical dimension and tie that together with the time and cost. And also think about the uncertainties in each of those. And I think activities provide us a way to do that if we will think about them, not just in terms of the time and money we put into them, but the quality of the information and outcomes they're providing. This provides a scaffolding, not just for planning and managing, tracking an individual project, but for organizational learning across projects. As we do more similar projects and generations of products and other types of things, we get better at this. We learn not just about the individual project, but what to look for across projects. And we can capture that in a useful way in this framework. So to conclude, I wanna just make sure a few key points are clear. First, when we think about doing work and its relationship to adding value in projects, there are a couple key intermediate ideas that matter a lot. First, it's not just the fact that we spent time and money to do work, but what is that work actually produced and accomplished? Is that information valuable, useful for our project? Does it reduce the risk of not getting what we want? And can we think about that as the path to adding value? Another big picture idea here is that essentially project management, program management, these things are risk management because every decision made by a project or program manager, essentially it should be reducing the risk that the project will not get what it wants. That whether it's to do something now or later, whether it's to put resources here or there, these are all essentially trade-offs being weighed that will increase or decrease risk in various parts of the project. So each decision could be viewed as a kind of risk management decision. And ultimately think about a project as the work we're doing to eliminate the risk of not getting what we want, not achieving the goals that we set out. Some portion of that project's value is being put at risk by the prevailing uncertainties. Can we chip away at those? Can we produce useful information that gives us a clearer picture of the project's actual value, hopefully aligning with our goals. So there's a quick overview. This has been mostly qualitative, conceptual. I again would like to point you to the papers on this topic. And those are again listed here at the bottom. These slides are available if you'd like to request them. And uh, with that, I would like to take your questions. Thank you so much, Tyson. This was fascinating. And I definitely feel that I personally learned a lot about what calculating risk can actually look like. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, which can be put in the live chat on our YouTube page, um, I wanted to ask about potential outcomes might look like, especially with new technologies or new, I don't know if product is the right word, but when you're dealing with things where it's much harder to figure out what those distributions will look like, do you just kind of slap a bell curve on it and call it a day or <laughs> is there a better way to do that? 
Good question. The quick short answer is see the papers for more explanation. And like I quickly mentioned in the presentation, there are various ways of doing it. And they range from, yes, simply slapping on a distribution, hopefully with some educated uh, framework for, for why you're putting, say, the, the mean or the most likely or the median at some particular point rather than another. But uh, often we can do much better than that, even with fairly novel type technologies and projects. The reason is because certain outcomes are just infeasible and because other outcomes are just unwanted and we would clearly abandon a project if we saw it heading towards that outcome. So here we're trying to collect the wisdom of those who know about this project and that could range from a few experts to really everyone involved. How we do that and whether we can do that efficiently depends somewhat on the technologies we have. Uh, Best Buy is a company, for example, that took an approach like this to forecasting demand for particular products and built it into their software where they pull all of their workers at all of their locations across uh, the world and ask them, what do they estimate demand for this particular product will be next week or next month? And they just pool all of those forecasts into an overall forecast. That's a similar idea that could be followed here. We're looking for people who know about this situation to tell us what they think the outcomes could be and why. And some people you'd think would mostly cluster towards the middle, but others might be outliers and they might have particular reasons for being especially optimistic or pessimistic. So those uh, reasons could be captured and all baked in here. And the first time one does this, yes, it's the most challenging, but there's a learning curve to doing this that makes it easier over time and as one does it with more PVAs and projects. That's really helpful, thank you. Um, so we do have some questions coming in on YouTube. Uh, one of them from Thomas Eisenberg, who asks, what experience do you have where the project value is not measured in dollars, where the outcome is truly binary, yes versus no? In these cases, uh, and by the way, it doesn't have to be in dollars. Let's see if I have a, yeah, here we go. Uh, this one happened to be for convenience. I will say it's most useful if you can express all of the PVAs in common units. That's probably more important than that those units be in dollars. They could be in terms of simple utility, like a zero to one scale. They could be a number of units sold. They could be in something else. But here, I also wanna point out this uh, upper left uh, value function for maximum range of the drone aircraft, happens to have a step function built in where it's determined that for this particular market they're looking at, there's just no value if it can't have a range greater than 2000 nautical miles. The, no one in the market's interested in that, probably because there exist other uh, products that already do that. And so notice that these value functions are affected by a variety of things, stakeholder preferences, wants, needs, market uh, forecast, and also what substitute or competitor uh, products or services might be available. And so all of those things get figured in here as well. So both these PVA value functions and the project capability distributions are challenging to produce the good news is they don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be exactly right, but just putting something down and then being open to refining it as we learn has been very valuable because it's very useful to just kind of know where we start, where we are. And if there are particular areas we need to know more about or we find that our outcomes are particularly sensitive to, we can then invest accordingly in learning about those specific areas. And that's really been one of the benefits here is helping direct resources accordingly. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tom Woodman asking about examples of using this to measure social impact. That's an interesting idea. And I haven't done that myself specifically, but I don't see why it couldn't figure in here. Really any key attribute of a project or its result, and some are easier to measure than others for sure, but even something like social impact, there have been a variety of metrics proposed for that. And so choosing one or more in a composite uh, could come up with some measure like that that could be useful and applied here. I should also mention that when we are focusing down on say five to 10 key salient PVAs for a project, clearly there's a lot of things that would be underneath those if we broke them down to lower levels. And although it's not in this particular example, another common one that's often used, especially in software, is just bugs or defects. So bugs, defects on one hand, obviously smaller is better, and then features and functions, larger is better, more is better. Those are two examples of very high level PVAs that could apply there. They're relatively easier to measure, uh, but others are less so, especially like design aesthetics. How do we measure how well we're doing in design? Is more or less better? What is more or less? How do we quantify that? Often this is done with focus groups and getting uh, feedback from stakeholders. Uh, it's obviously not a perfect science, but we do learn more and more about it all the time and more and more can be learned in the context of specific types of products. This is certainly where marketing expertise is valuable. And so we wanna capture the best information we can get, albeit imperfect, and put it here into our decision-making framework so that we can design and manage a project with it. So there's a question from Michael Winoker who uh, says, excellent talk, which agreed, but asks whether you have any thoughts on the use of machine learning to estimate outcomes, such as for drone endurance or the demand estimate example that you presented. Short answer is I'm intrigued by the possibilities, but it has not been done yet to my knowledge. Now that's not to say it truly hasn't been done because a lot of organizations using this type of framework, uh, I would say the number of organizations is not that many, but uh, a lot of what they're doing is proprietary. So I, I don't know if they've gone so far as to make such an application, but I could definitely see the potential. I think that's a fair answer. A question from Don W who asks, what if any is the role of the critical path diagram in reducing risk in complex projects? So could you restate the, the name of the diagram, the critical? The critical path diagram. Ah, critical path. Good, so critical path is essentially trying to tell us which activities, if they got delayed, would end up delaying the overall project. That's good information to know for every project manager to distinguish them from the activities that could experience some delay, hopefully without delaying the overall project. Those critical path activities may or may not have the highest direct effects on these PVAs and revising the project capability distributions. Therefore, we might think about critical activities more broadly than just their effect on a schedule. We might think about them in terms of their effect on value, which activities are critical because they have the highest leverage to change the project value. Realizing that project value is partly determined by the project's duration and therefore the time until the project can be delivered or provided to stakeholders. But that's only one aspect of its value. Certainly some stakeholders are willing to pay more to get it faster, others not. Sometimes there are penalties for being late, sometimes not. 
Some stakeholders would prefer better performance, even if they had to wait longer. These are the types of questions that we can weigh against each other and determine value adding trade offs with this type of framework. So, yes, I do agree. Critical activities should be defined more broadly than merely their effect on delaying a project, and that critical activities should be the highest value leverage activities. Thank you. So we've come up to one o'clock. So usually we end these after an hour. Uh, people are welcome to email us at sdmcommunications at mit.edu if they would like these slides for the talk or to be put in touch with Tyson. Uh, thank you again to everyone who attended the webinar. Again, the presentation recording will be available online after this session. And we hope you'll join us next time on May 25th for a webinar with Jean Ellifson, Assistant Professor of Analytics at Alfred University. Thank you again to Tyson Browning for joining us today. And on behalf of the System Design and Management Program, thank you to our attendees for joining us.